I've learned that piling on to a conversation is the way to have a good conversation. It's not to say, I've got the solution, let me now propose it to you. My name is Ben Charland, and you're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is Jessica Johnson, executive editor and creative director of The Walrus magazine based in Toronto, and that's where we have this conversation. It's a really interesting chat that we have when we talk about a lot of different things. The changing state and model of journalism, the role of the editor and the writer, Donald Trump, of course, and we talk about sports and the hunt for the great walrus sports story. We talk about how a lot of decisions have been devolved to the individual, whether that's democracy or climate change or how we structure our society. The false dichotomy between left and right. The question, what makes a good conversation? And this word conversation is critical to the walrus and to how they run their magazine, developing and creating and nurturing conversation across Canada and the world. It's a really, really interesting conversation, and I hope you take the time not just to listen to it, but to let me know what you think of it. You can go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, and find all previous episodes as well as this one, and a way to get in touch with me by email or on social media. If you like this podcast, you can give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or on Facebook or on whatever podcast app that you use. I'd really love to hear from you and for you to keep this conversation going. Jessica Johnson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really excited to chat with you. We're here at the Walrus Foundation in Toronto, and um, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. You're the executive editor and creative director of the Walrus magazine, is that right? Yes. Excellent. Um, And that's a change from what used to be the case, right? Did did there used to be an editor-in-chief or a different title? The the title has changed a bit over time from... um well, the Walrus has a few different editors since 2003 when it was founded. So at one time it was editor, I think, under John McFarlane. John McKay, uh, John Kay was editor-in-chief. And then I was already the creative director when I was appointed, and the pr- publisher had decided to change the title of the job to executive editor. So I just ended up with, with both titles. Right. It's basically the same job. Um, my role oversees all the content that yeah. is produced at the Walrus. The reason I bring that up is because it's part of the progression of journalism over the past 16 years. I mean, a title is just a title, but you know, journalism itself has been under incredible pressures, and that's reflected on the way that magazines and newspapers are published and managed. And the, you know, obviously the old idea of separating the marketing room from the editing room, those things are, are becoming a bit intertwined with time. And that has ramifications for our politics, our democracy. Um, and we're going to get into that, obviously. But before we do, you've got the first question, as always. Uh, Jessica, what on earth is going on? I used to answer that question, used to meaning like a year ago, by talking about um, the business model of journalism and how a lot of outlets are struggling to survive. I think that's been talked about and I'm it comes up in everything that we do but what what in the world is going on right now is the intersection of the role of journalism in society which we've seen really come to a new pro- prominence I think since the election of Donald Trump in 2016 in America um, and social media so big tech companies like Facebook and Google what is their role in ensuring democracy that's an important question in Canada as we head into a fall 2019 election and then government is kind of caught off to the side of that we're not really used to them even playing a role in in uh, journalism but they've increasingly been forced to because they're sort of like a middleman between Facebook Google Twitter journalism and its non-sustainable economic model in most cases and then the public and that's a weird triangulation it's not something that someone like me had to think about in 2005 um in 2000 and tw- in 2010 but now it's something that editors i think do think about and have to think about yeah um thomas friedman's book thank you for being late i don't know if you've read this or heard of this book no but i know his work yeah and he talks about the three major factors of change today Um, One of them being globalization, one of them being technology, and um, there there were the three M's, um, 
yeah, uh, Moore's Law being technology. Um, and oh, I forget the third one. Anyways, th- th- there's this fascinating cauldron of things that are provoking change today. And it feels like we're in an accelerated time. And that sometimes we're guilty of being chronocentric, of privileging our own time over others. But we seem to be at the behest of all of these different forces acting upon us. You mentioned social media. You mentioned the election of Donald Trump. I mean, these are big, big events, but there are underlying currents as well. Uh, Journalism was changing much longer before the election of, of Donald Trump. And even before the rise of the Internet, the way that we receive and imbibe the news um, was different because our culture had changed as well in the Western world. So how much of that is part of your job as an editor of, a, of, of essentially Canada's national magazine of our, of our conversation? How much is your job about kind of balancing off these forces and making sure the conversation is still primal in, in our minds? Well, you've asked two good questions and they're, they're connected. So one is, is the role of an editor changing? And the other is, is the role of journalism changing in our society? And the answer is yes and no. Editors like me, who have existed in our current form, I'm going to say for about 100 years, because that's when you had the rise of magazines like The New Yorker, which presented a sort of consumer model for serious journalism that evolved over 100 years. Um, You can't dissociate what you're doing from the revenue. And when times are good, you don't have to. Editors used to go around for fancy lunches and have, you know, three martinis and really be a curator of ideas. And just at least that was the idea. I don't think that's ever actually existed in reality. But the myth is that an editor is just a sort of like lofty person who has some good conversations with people and encourages talent. And then the money was supposed to follow, you know, famously like um, writers in the 70s got paid pretty good money to just write good articles but most of the time it's been an incredible hustle so i'm kind of going a bit all over the place here no it actually reminds me of 18th century man men of letters who were often either aristocrats or patronized by aristocrats who we think of as just having this time to idly think up new ideas and and let the world come into them and regurgitate it back out but but reading the journals of writers at that time, we know that it was a hustle then as it is a hustle now. Yeah, so the money and the readership have always been intertwined. And most publications used to get their revenue from advertising. It was rarely the actual consumer that was paying for the product. Like if you look at the actual cost of making a newspaper or a magazine and distributing it, the print is very expensive. Digital is cheaper. Um, I want to come back to something else, though, yeah. which is so if you were an editor today and you were just thinking, my beautiful, important journalism, I must get it out into the world. That's great. But how are you going to pay for it? Because the people who read you for free on the Internet are not going to pay for it. Um, they are getting it for free. And that is... I think an important realization, which in turn comes back to, well, how do you keep a free press? How do you keep a strong voice for citizenry? But I think all of our messages have gotten really murky. And I think a lot of people are talking about the role of media and society as being like some kind of salvation for democracy, but not talking about where their money's coming from. And that means who's funding you. That means, you know, I don't, I think, we're, we're operating in a Canadian space, so we can talk pretty specifically about the examples. Um, the newspapers have be- are, are about to benefit, if they haven't benefited already, from a pretty sizable tax grant that they can get from the government. Um, and I'm not saying that that's bad or good, but I'm saying that it's impossible to be an editor now and sort of say, I'm above money. Mm-hmm. I don't think about it. I shouldn't have to think about it. And um, I, I think we still do the same job. And at the same time, this expectation from the audience is of accountability for fact. You can't be wrong. Transparency. You can't be, um, for instance, if you want to talk about the role of social media, you can't be doing paid posts without saying that you're doing paid posts. You have to be completely accountable. Here's how we research this. Here's how we've put it together. And... I think that that 
thing is tied back to who is the truth teller of our society. So I think a lot of a, a lot of people talk the talk, but I don't know if they necessarily walk the walk. One thing that you've mentioned um, before in writing, uh, which had to do with your predecessor, is that you, your predecessor wanted eyeballs at any cost, whereas you are looking for lasting, meaningful engagement with readers and with not just readers, but people who attend walrus events across the country. And that seems to me to be a bit of a response to the the pressures that you've just talked about but i wonder is the walrus i don't mean to say that it's completely separate but is there a greater sense of insulation from the the money side because it's a non-profit because there's a foundation that allows the magazine to, to do its work i mean that was part of the intent back in 2003 to make sure there was a magazine that could exist without the need to go to the lowest common denominator yeah so um I want to answer both things because they're slightly different. The walrus is insulated. We were established as a nonprofit in 2007. And ever since then, what does that mean? Under the current structure that we're defined by, that means that we can get a certain percentage of our income from philanthropy, that we must have an educational mandate. So our content is free of obligation to, you know, advertisers or any sort of financial investor. Um, It has become more important philanthropy over the years. And there's sort of like a pie, like if I drew, where does the walrus money come from? A much bigger part of it used to come from advertising and circulation um, with, you know, some events and then some philanthropy. Philanthropy is now the biggest part of that pie with circulation and advertising forming an important but smaller part of it and then events and sponsorships forming forming another part of it. So it's just the trend is growing and it will always evolve. It will it will never be the same. But it does mean that yes, you're not talking to the editor of another Canadian publication who might be trying to hustle to make money from like ad impressions, but you just don't want to be there. You can't survive in that climate. Um, some people are making more money out of soliciting donations um other people are going to be following our our philanthropic model i think they'll find that it's difficult it's taken about less than 15 years but it's only really within the last few years that i would say that you could do an operation like the walrus and have a sense of financial longevity which over the last two or three years has really emerged for me so i don't sit here worrying about do I have to do this story to make this person happy? Do mm-hmm. I, am I going to have a staff in six months? Like, no, I don't worry about that. I think we run a really, really tight, thoughtful operation, but we know exactly what we can do and we just do that. I remember when Donald Trump was elected, one of the big things that was happening in the discourse in North America, specifically the United States, was should people pay for their news? Should people yeah. pay for their information? Because part of the conversation was, well, this guy was elected because of all of, well, quote unquote fake news, which now he has co-opted as a term to describe anything he doesn't like. And I don't mean to make this conversation about the guy that sucks the oxygen out of seemingly every conversation. No, it's fine to talk about Donald Trump. But like, we're not done talking about <laughs> Donald Trump. Nor, and and nor, nor, nor should we be. But I guess the question is, you know, should we not just prevent someone like him, but to prevent us from going down these dark holes of ignorance, should we pay for our information? Should we pay for our news? If you're not paying for it, you can't critique it. So, mm. and and the same goes for everything. If people hate Facebook and Twitter, well, you're not paying for it. Like we're all using these platforms for free. So the bigger question, I think, and I used to spend a lot more time talking about Donald Trump in, in the year of um, the fall of 2016, but definitely all of 2017 was just thinking about Donald Trump. 2018 for me was a year much more thinking about Canadian democracy. What was the state? And and that's partly because Canada is an interesting country. Um, We've traditionally had a more um, inward focused media. This was the year where walrus stories are, I don't know if you've actually passed that point yet, but there's many readers outside Canada in addition to within Canada. So you're just starting to see like the whole notion of things that you might've taken for granted once, like where is your audience? Who is your audience? Um, What perspective do you have to take on something? It's very important here to have a healthy journalistic climate that can reflect the stories of this country. Um, But you said something earlier that I want to talk about, which is the strategy. So 
when I came, this is my third year at the Walrus coming to an end, which is crazy. Um, just because so much has happened in a short time. But when I came here, Jonathan Kay was the editor. John really created the groundwork for the current digital strategy at the Walrus. He and I at that time, and, and what you said about eyeballs at any cost, that's kind of my interpretation of some conversations we had. I don't know, I don't believe that he would be following that strategy exactly the same today. No one would. Right. It's that publications are um, affected by where the growth trends are in the industry. So when all publications that used to be like print discovered the internet, a whole bunch of stuff happened. And I like to say mistakes were made. So there was this idea that you should get as much content up as quickly as possible and to reach as many people. And what we're learning, partly because of the analytics that we get back from Facebook and Google, is that you can have a million eyeballs, but they're not necessarily valuable to you. If a person only stays on a story for five seconds, that eyeball wasn't important. They aren't going to develop a relationship with you. They don't care where they saw something. If they're spending less than a minute on, on a story for us, that means they didn't really read it. They weren't invested in it. So that's not a meaningful eyeball. It used to be much more important to show to, to um, advertisers the number of page views that you had. Now, and this is partly based on just recent research in the last quarter, we're now about halfway through 2018, um, we're starting to use the word loyalty a lot more. So this old fashioned idea that 10 years ago would have sounded ridiculous, but you want people to come back to your site or your publication and develop a reputation with you. I, I think that's part of the, the feeling of reading a magazine too. I mean, on mm -hmm. your desk, we have several editions of The Walrus, the yeah. physical copies. And I'm a subscriber. I get the physical copy. And that's what, I'm, that's what I actually want from it because I want someone else to curate it for me. I'm actually kind of sick of going on to Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is and having to be the curator of my own content. And I don't mean this from like the typical democratic point of view, which is that we build our own echo chambers and then we get we get deeper and deeper into them so that we aren't exposed to other ideas. That when we go into Netflix, everything is recommended to us based on what we like rather than based on what we might need to hear. And I don't want to do that anymore. And I like opening up a, a copy of The Walrus and finding an article that, oh, I don't know if I want to read this because I don't know if I, A, I don't know if I care, and B, I don't know if I'll agree with it. And that's the funny thing, that there's a study recently that was done that shows that people, if you pay people 10 bucks to, um, to read a bunch of articles, they will accept a cut of that, of that pay to $7 if they only get to read friendly stuff, stuff that agrees with their opinions. Mm. In other words, that there is a cost to them, a value to having to put up with other people's points of view. It physically, it feels like it harms them. It feels like it harms me, I guess, if I do that. So when I come up on the walrus to an article that I don't want to read, that might bore me, that I might not be interested in or have no connection to, there's a part of me that goes, well, hold on a second. What are you going to feel at the end of this article? And I'm never disappointed. I've always learned, obviously, I've learned something new because I'm approaching something I didn't, that I'm not connected to. And that's almost the, the power and the beauty of a, of a magazine. And I wonder... If there's a similar way to do that, maybe you just said it with creating meaningful, lasting engagement in the digital space to give people the same same feeling of just curate this for me. Give me an experience that I'll, I might change at the end of it from who I was at the beginning. Thank you for saying all of that. Um, I'm glad you like the mix. We do think about it. And there's some things that you're not getting because we know that probably a person like you wouldn't like that thing. I can talk more about that later. You mean, sorry, do you mean like articles that are, would be disagreeable or? It's not really, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage confirmation bias. Like right. I don't want to read, I don't want to read um, only news that's coming from a certain political perspective. That's yeah. not actually helpful to me as a human. Um, I do want to read things that, well, let's talk about why people come to the Walrus. The readership is genuine, genuinely very engaged in ideas. They want to build a better society, however you frame that. You know, that they, they think that um, discussion is important. They, they tend to be very interested in education. That's one thing that stands out um, about the, t the people who tend to subscribe is that they frequently, you know, have like one or two degrees or education as in some other way that you would define it. Um, and 
we know that they think certain subjects are very important. Um, they think politics are important. They also think the arts are important. Our readers tend not to think sports are very important, which I've tried and tried to test. <laughs> like, hmm. like, well, you didn't like that sport. What if you like this sport? They're like, no, we don't like sports. Interesting. Yeah, so the, the, the hunt for the great walrus sports story is still kind of like an ongoing thing. But then I'm like, well... Maybe they just get that elsewhere. Like, maybe they don't need that from us. Do you think that the Toronto Raptors victory in, in 2019 would be a fair option for that kind of story? We have d we have done some Raptor stuff, and we'll do a bit more Raptor stuff. I happen to love basketball. This is maybe why I'm sort of like, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, though, there's something about the psychology of the Canadian sports fan. Like, that would be the way that I would do it now, because I'm like... You know, a lot of people love the Leafs. A lot of our readers love the Leafs. I don't think it's that they don't like hockey. It's that there's something about the way that they're used to having sports talked about with them that it either doesn't work in this format, we're not the place they want it. I don't know. I, I, I want to figure that out because I do think that sports and Canada really go together and I don't accept sure. I don't accept that 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 we shouldn't do that. Well, I don't, and I don't accept that people who are intelligent, thoughtful, interested in ideas, interested in the future of our democracy, for example, and interested in the arts, are not yeah. also interested in the Olympics, in basketball, in yeah. hockey, in sports statistics, in cricket, in, in whatever sport you want to talk you about. You know what? Like, it just, like, we do Olympic stories. They just don't get the eyeballs. Like... They just don't. I don't know. I we've tried. I've tried like <laughs> how many sports have I tried now? I don't know. I think it's something about the relationship we have with our bodies and the relationship we have with sports and culture. Is it something about the hero story too? Like, uh, sorry, I'm just brainstorming here. I'm not no. trying to come into the editor's office and say this is what you should. Why write not? About this is what the office is for: <laughs> is for but, people to come in and talk. But, about but it. I get the sense that when I read about sports, not that I read, I, I, I'm not a reader of sports, but when I do see an article in the Sun or in a newspaper or online or whatever, there's a heroic aspect to it. There's the, there's always the underdog. There's always the champion. There's always there's this 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 almost fantastical universe of heroes and demons and good guys and bad guys and whatever region you're from or, or your tribe, of course, are the, the good guys. This is basic human psychology. And the foreigners, the, this is almost a replacement for war too. The foreigners, the guys from Ottawa or Calgary or whatever, are the bad guys. And it's easy to create these mythologies in there. And to someone who studies history, to someone interested in ideas and the arts, someone who goes to see a play, that's a bit ridiculous. Right, that that kind of tribalism might catch us in an arena, but we know that there's something wrong with it. We know that there's something inherently problematic. And I guess, I mean, if I were to ask someone who agrees with what I just said, then what are you interested in sports for? There's something still basically human about it. So I used to work in the theater, and I remember figuring out how powerful sports were as a lesson for actors. Because athletes are doing everything they possibly can to achieve their objective, right? So a hockey player is doing whatever they can with their teammates, with their stick, with their equipment, with the, uh, the enemy players, with the goalie to score a goal. Really simple. But they, they put their entire mind, body, and soul into that singular focused effort. And actors often become deluded on stage because we have so many things to think about. No, you don't. You have one thing, one objective. Go get that objective for an actor. And how revealing sports could be to say, just pursue it mm -hmm. was, was powerful for me in the theater. It worked for me as a director with actors. Be an athlete. Don't be a thinker. Your job as an actor is to pursue an objective. And I know I'm saying the same thing over and over, but there seemed to be something in sports that revealed a deeper reality of the human condition of not just seeking greatness, not being the hero, but pursuing something beyond yourself, perhaps. And that was a big lesson for me, which is connected to ideas that we deal with every day. It's not, it's not like, it's not page three of the, of the sun, which is next to page two that used to be the sunshine girl. It's a different thing. Anyways, I just went off on one. What do you I think? think that's, <laughs> I think that's really good. I think that's really interesting. I think it's really good advice for writers. Just go after it. There's a point in some of our story meetings where we say, let's not walrus this to death. 
which means like we'll take some topic and we'll 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 sort of overthink it and talk about it and then we're like is this a fun story no like let's just get rid of it like it <laughs> it should it should be fun back to sports i don't know like i mean i i wonder like do smart people not like sports I don't think that's true. I just don't. I, I see. I meet too many people who are really smart and again interested in ideas and arts, who read the sports page and, and are interested in the statistics and go to a game and enjoy it. I don't know. I like reading about tennis. I like wa- tennis is one of my favorite sports to watch, and that only came to me some years ago when I was at Wimbledon in England, and I didn't know anything about tennis, and I realized how powerful of a game it is for the individual to overcome another individual it's a very mental game. it has narrative to it yeah um which maybe is part of it like long form journalism in whatever medium lends it whether it's radio whether it's you know r- reading an article it has a stru- sense of structure it has a sense of narrative i think maybe um some things you experience in the body in the moment a good meal sex sports not everything is some things are better experienced than described. Yeah. And I think sports are, especially when you're in the sport, that's obvious. Mm-hmm. That if you're not paying attention to the moment, you can't possibly succeed. You know, I mean, only the great athletes like Wayne Gretzky who could say, don't pay attention to where the puck is at, but where the puck is going. Well, you can't, only only if you're spending so much time in the moment can you actually add on that other moment. Mm-hmm. For most amateur athletes, paying attention to where the puck is going, like, that's 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 overthinking it, I think. But if our writers all did that, everything would be really hard to follow. Like writing's so difficult. It's really, especially here, um, an iterative process where you like you do like a few drafts. A, a writer will talk to their editor a lot before they actually start writing to figure out how do I tell this story in the way that people will understand it the most meaningfully, and that takes time and conversation and a team and and um you know a bunch of readers and stuff like that it's old fashioned to what extent is writing th- that as well as a kind of spontaneous impulse to to tell a story that's just coming to me like a lightning bolt right now so that spontaneous impulse is important and you need to listen to it because that's where good ideas come from but i've spent a lot of time as a writer like tw- 25 years almost now. And when I started, I thought I had this idea, I think it was maybe informed by like the uh, visions of Beethoven and classical music, but that you would be like so consumed with your art, you'd be locked in your room. And yeah. no, anytime I tried to do that, I almost went crazy. Like the two times that I had like unlimited time and space to write, I just lost my mind. And I actually think that the process of writing is you, you just do a little bit of it, go away, think about it, come back to a little bit more of it, go away, think about it. Outlining is important, but I think that's true for any project. And I think that we're really hard on ourselves and we sort of romanticize the process at the expense of doing the process. Yeah, it's funny about writing. It's one of the most romanticized processes I can think of. And one of the least fun things to actually do. Unless it's unless that one time where you forget that it's not supposed to be fun and it's fun again, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I honestly think that you're so right about it being so hard on ourselves about writing, and it, it's this, I don't know, Hemingway, for example, did us no good as writers, even though he was no. an incredible writer because he made it seem so. What was it? You know, you you type on your typewriter until blood comes out, that kind of stuff. I mean, maybe true. Sure, but you, we've we've created this ideal, an, an idea of writing as something that is so difficult when in fact sometimes, and not, not, not necessarily to say that an article in the Waller needs to be just a fun time for a writer, but that there's something in it that, that could be fun from the beginning. And we miss that. Well, what if it were fun is one of the pieces of advice that I give myself. The different writers need different things too. They need different things at different times in their life, different projects. And we have like a lot of writers who've written for us for a long time. Um, Jason McBride is one I'd like to talk about because he's a career journalist, has been a writer for 
I don't know what, decades. And he will write extremely difficult long form investigative pieces and he will spend, he will do a political profile. He will spend six months with someone doing something. So he's done a bit of everything. He did a story for us that um, was a bit, was about Esther the Wonder Pig. I read that. Yeah. yeah so Esther the Wonder Pig um, is probably the world's most famous pig. She has many followers on the internet and she's famous kind of for just being a pig that teaches people about what being a pig is like, but she lives in a sanctuary in rural Ontario. And um, like a lot of people would have said that the Esther shouldn't be a story in the walrus because it was like, well, why would you do a story about a pig that's a social media star? And I'm like, this pig is about everything. You know, it's about animal rights. It's about why do we privilege some animals and not others. It's about the role of social media and connecting people to nature. It's about like these two guys that just, they, they bought a, what they thought was a micro pig and it turned out to be a huge pig. So then they changed their life and like moved to the country and raised this pig. Well, and moreover, the, the very fact that this pig is a social media store story is the story. It is the story. And it's a Canadian pig. Like, it's just here. And, and then partway through the story, Esther, like, got breast cancer. And yeah. there was no um, scanner big enough at Guelph to, like, check a pig. And the, I think this, the, what came up was, like, usually pigs are just killed if they get, like, big animals. We don't save them. So then... Esther's father's like raised the money partly to help get Guelph this big scanner for large animals, which they now have. So like injured animals are like treated that way. But anyway, so Jason McBride is the writer and he and I had been sort of talking about what his next story would be. And Jason's a lifelong vegetarian. He talks about that in the story, but he just took this. He had so much fun. He went to visit Esther. It was hard. Like he had to sort of convince her parents, owners, why he should interview Esther, why he should be allowed oh, really? to follow around. Oh, really? It wasn't an automatic... No, oh, yeah, they were like, we don't need any more people hanging around. Plus, it's a pig. Like, leave us alone. We're busy. And <laughs> um, he loved writing that story, and you could feel it. You can feel it on the page. Like, So that's an example of a person who's maybe waited all their life to do that story. And then the chance came, and he just did it. And it was, like, fast, and it needed very little editing. Like, a little bit of editing would be, like, not so much about the pig, but... Do you know what I remember about mm -hmm. that story when I read it was that it was kind of like, do you watch the show Black Mirror? No. Um, so it's a, it's like the Twilight Zone and every yeah. episode is its own world usually. And it's usually a little bit into the future, kind of horrifying with where things are going and where things might end up just five years from now, where the, the social media, the social credit system that's being developed in China right now, where you're being ranked on how you buy groceries and how you jaywalk across the street and, and what your finances are like in your family. You're being rated and, and your, your rating on this system determines um, what jobs you get, where you can travel, what kind of perks you get and where you live. This was a Black Mirror episode set in North America as well. And when you, and it was only a couple of years ago and watching it, I remember, God, that would be awful. It's happening. It's happening now in the world's largest country. And when I read the story about Esther the pig, I remember thinking that this would be ridiculous to someone 10 years ago. This, this story would be, what? How could it? It wouldn't make any sense. And it seemed like it was a Black Mirror episode told to a person 10 years ago. It's ridiculous to some people now. Like, I'm, it, totally. I'm from Saskatchewan originally, and I happened to be home visiting, and I saw um, some friends who, you know, some of whom are farmers, and they were like, it's a pig. Like, you give 5,000 words to a pig. And I'm like, no. only... Sorry, go That's ahead. That's not what you... I, I'm like, they're like, only a city person would do this. What do you mean? I, I was going to say that when I read the article, that was obvious that it's just a pig. There yeah. was no sense in that article where I thought, oh, they're making the pig out to be something more <laughs> than it is. The author is clearly saying, no, it's really just a pig, guys. This is, And these people who are taking care of the pig are normal people. They're not PR moguls coming in from New York to make this into an Instagram star. Yeah, These are normal people with a normal pig. And the normalcy of it was, I think, the point of the story. Because how does normalcy become so starstruck in the world? I'm glad you saw that. That, I think, is very important, certainly to me, but maybe to the writer, too. And probably to the people in the story but it really is about like why do we privilege some lives over others mm -hmm. where are we at like anyway to get back to your question i think we're asking a lot of questions right now about the kind of world we live in the kind of world we want to live in that's not something i remember so much from when i was growing up it feels like that's a very contemporary phenomenon what do you mean by that like that that 
that we're very concerned about the world that we we're live in. We're very concerned about the world we live in. And I know that our yeah. parents were too, but I think that there's something about this time that change is happening very quickly. We're not quite sure that we're growing in the right way. It's not quite clear what to do about that. In my case too, you feel sometimes like you're not supposed to ask these questions. That you're not supposed to... You're not supposed to ask these questions. Well, it's very earnest. Like, um, the deal with technology was supposed to be that it was the best thing ever. An opening force. And it hasn't really been questioned until quite recently, I think. Yeah. In this generation. I I agree. And I I think too, I remember the third M from Thomas Friedman's book. It's Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. So Moore's Law Markets and Mother Nature. So climate change. And one thing that feels different in my life today, I'm 34, is that when I was growing up, yeah, I mean, there's the ozone layer, there's problems with that, there's yeah. pollution. But someone was going to be on that, right? We are on it. We're figuring this out. We're going to deal with this. Yeah. These, are, these are human problems. They're human created and they're going to be human solved. And now we have this gargantuan problem that may be insoluble. And I think we, all of us, walk around every day with the feeling that, uh, yeah, I don't know about the future. That animates populism. I think that animates our concerns about democracy. I think that animates the way that we build cities. And I think it certainly animates the way that we consume magazines, the way that we consume chocolate, the way that we consume a- anything in a grocery store. I think that we're animated this by this idea that the future is not only uncertain, but probably we're headed for a cliff and there's nothing we can do about it. Whether or not that's true, it feels like that's our paradigm today in 2019. Here's something that struck me in this conversation so far. It's a piece of advice that Jessica gives herself. What if it were fun? Now, coming up in this conversation, we talk about the idea of conversation and how that's integral to democracy. And here's one point, the importance of talking to people on the other side, not talking at them and not just listening, but having an authentic dialogue. It's important to Jessica, it's important to me, and I think if you're listening to this, it might be important to you too. That's all coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. Do you think that there's too much pressure on the individual to be responsible for all of their own solutions? Um, yes, I do. Because you feel like there's no governing body or no one, could, nothing could be big enough or strong enough to kind of solve it all? I think that there's a constant stream of guilt. I mean, I think I know, and I think most people know that there's, it doesn't matter what I do that to solve climate change. Like I, I am a minuscule factor, me individually. But I also know that, that if we all think that way, we're screwed. Well, I think we have an editor on staff here who's very smart, who works on all of science stories. And she's pointed out that the onus for solving climate change for way too long has been passed on to individuals. Like, you don't use Ziploc bags because that's bad for the environment. But the the depth of the problem, they say it's like there's 100 companies that are the top polluters, whereas if they would just... So we're not actually holding the major polluters to account. And I think that's part of the problem. I'm going to sound like maybe a raving person right now, but I think capitalism has been allowed to fail such that it's actually failed the original principles that were supposed to be making society good. And I'm hearing more and more of that come up um, when I go to universities, when I go to lectures. There's a whole bunch of books that have come out just this year on like capitalism and democracy. Is it too late to save it? These are not conversations that the average person was really supposed to be thinking about 10 years ago. Maybe we were always supposed to be thinking about it. And in this part of the world, we were just living in ignorance. But I'm shocked at how many of my days have meetings in them, like future of democracy luncheon and yeah. like a cocktail party to save democracy. Well, when I ask people the question, what on earth is going on? I'd say nine times out of 10, that's on the tip of a person's tongue. That the future of our democracy, the future of the structure of our of our society, capitalism included. And I think that it's impossible to not grapple with that because it's so present, but it's also so sudden. Ten Here, years ago, we weren't talking about this. Here's a walrus cover from last December, and the cover line is the Russian threat to Canadian democracy. Um, that's relevant to election tampering and some of the conversations that are in the air going into this one. But that would not have been allowed to be, that just wouldn't have been a resonant cover line 
until relatively recently, but now we're asking all the big questions. We're sort of throwing everything out on the table and saying, let's have this big, hairy conversation. Well, some people have said, especially on the left, that this is a good thing, that, 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 that the fact that we're grappling with these big questions is it's about time that we're doing this. Because up till now, liberal democracy has been managerial in form, unquestioned, as Noam Chomsky has said, like outside of the mainstream. We just call it kind of all accept that democracy and capitalism are here to say uh, Francis Fukuyama's idea that this is the end of history. The ideological endpoint of human progression is liberal democracy. And now we're saying, oh, wait a minute, maybe not. Maybe there are other, maybe we have to either rejig this or rethink it entirely. And I think that that is definitely the, the conversation. But back to your question about the individual, I think that solving this problem of the future of our democracy, for example, has also been devolved to the individual because it's all for each of us to figure out for ourselves. Yeah. And I think that that is exciting because it creates a really interesting conversation like the one that we're having now, but it's also problematic because how do we have 7 billion um, conclusions on that question and act in any united way on a challenge as crucial and critical as climate change, for example? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, you have a voice. Some people have a much louder voice than they, they ever did before. It's, um, it's the blessing and a curse of the organization of human society. Yeah. I mean, when I was in university, we used to have like collectives on campus. I was quite active politically. I went to UBC. And yeah, um, you were in the creative writing program. Though, I right? did do the creative yeah. writing program. Yeah. But if you ever have watched a collective try to talk its way out of making an important decision, you'll know that it won't happen. It'll just keep being talked about. I did collective creation in the theater. So, Great. Yeah. So I, we, we, where we yeah. would develop works of art collectively. And it was very rewarding when it worked, but extremely challenging and disappointing when it didn't. Well, I think about this all the time, actually, about the structure of power. Is it inevitable that you have chaos and then you elect a leader and then, you know, like it's, I don't know. I don't even want to have that conversation. <laughs> I will say this. <laughs> I think in liberal democracies, and I'll use Canada as an example, there's a false dichotomy that's been created between economic growth on one side, which we assume is a conservative position, yeah. and then concern for human quality of life on the other, which we assume is a liberal condition. And I'm like, why do we assume there's only two options, first of all, and that they're not interconnected? So that is how I would solve democracy today, if I were a politician or anyone, is like, Let's stop talking about these things like a liberal says we need more daycare, we need more minimum wage, and a conservative says, oh, we can't afford it. But meanwhile, we're making all this money here. But the problem is, is both sides make both arguments. So a, a conservative would say, yeah, we'll get to your quality of life if you unleash the economy. Yeah. And a liberal would say, you'll get an incredible economy if you just provide good quality of life. Yeah. So and it's so just they're they're kind of skipping you're making a good point but they're almost skipping around it and saying just do what we say and you'll get both well it makes for good debates and our media political system structure i've been thinking about this a lot watching the democratic primaries in the us and i'm like we're assume we're going into an election assuming that a fight is going to yield the truth or something like that yeah it's anyway. a funny it's a funny thing that we do to ourselves in politics we force ourselves to fight and assume that this is the one. This mm -hmm. is the one. Mm -hmm. This is the one person. This is the one election, most important election of all time. I don't know. Did we do that before the last four years or so, saying that this is the most important one ever? I, I, I Maybe we did. I don't know. I think we've passed the point um, where one leader can be all things to all people, and that's part of the pain point that we're feeling. I actually thought this when I got this job at the Walrus, because I am a woman, I'm the first woman editor of The Walrus, I underestimated how people would see that as some kind of symbol. I'm, I th I am also not a woman of color. I'm not disabled. Um, I think, can one person speak to all people and satisfy all groups? And I'm like, I think we're asking the wrong question when we look at leadership and what it means. So the same thing comes to pass when you talk about who can represent a country. Um, Justin Trudeau has done well because he acknowledges the difference among people. Um, and that's important. But I think in the U.S., Donald Trump's style has been 
I will be your savior, hmm. even though he doesn't even really do the things he said he was going to do either. But it, they both just kind of feel like an outdated model for well, leadership. May, maybe leadership is kind of like you were mentioning writing is, which is that it's iterative and that it's not a announcement of salvation and then a delivery of salvation, but rather a, a long process with no actual end of continuing to work through things. It reminds me of Barack Obama's A More Perfect Union speech, which he gave in the 2008 election, where he says that he said that the whole point of the United States experiment is to slowly try to work towards perfection, knowing that we'll never get there. Mm-hmm. But that the but it's not about finally solving all of our problems with the Messiah, mm-hmm. but figuring out what our problems now and trying to just be a little bit better tomorrow. And it's an inspiring speech because it it's actually it, it's realistic, even though yeah. it's all caught up in rhetoric and ideals. Um, and I think leadership, therefore, may be an iterative act as opposed to and and you've said this before that it's not your job to be the personification of the Walrus magazine. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the one thing I knew from day one. I wrote on a post-it note, no ego, because that's the thing I've seen so many people in jobs that are exciting get attached to. And over time, you start to think that you're the reason the publication is mm-hmm. so great or the company's running so well or something like that. You think, I'm so wonderful. And I'm like, no, we are all dispensable. We are doing jobs for now. We're doing a project. And there will probably be a time when someone else should be doing that project. Um, it's a hard lesson to keep in mind because you have your ego always kind of wants to take over. I think that's a lesson for people on the other side too. That um, if my life sucks, if I just got fired, if I've been diagnosed with cancer or I'm just paying a lot of taxes and I, I can't make ends meet or whatever it is, you know what? It's not just because of me. It's not just because of the things that I've done. There are other forces at play. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm at the behest of this world and all of the forces and pressures within it. And so to to say that it's all my fault is a mistake. Just to say that it's all my doing that this is so great is a mistake. And I think that that's a, that that getting rid of ego, or at least abstaining from it as much as possible, is a powerful lesson for anybody in any position. But the hardest time for it is probably the extreme of either leadership or despair you are right well thank you you said (laughs) i'm I'm so glad to have this conversation i get to be confirmed so many times it's not what i thought i started talking a lot at the beginning about the state of the world and it's probably too abstract to start off with we needed to start with something smaller i find that when 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 i or my guest knows what we're going to talk about it has to by definition become something else yeah, that's because that's what a conversation does, I yeah. think. And I wanted to ask you about a con- so the walrus uses this word conversation as, as as an identifying brand. What we're trying to do, yeah. Yeah, and I and it it works for me because I feel like I'm in conversation with the writers and there's and it's and the the walrus is also um, trying to do a lot of events across the country and mm-hmm. create conversations that way. But what what makes a good conversation? So. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Cool. Yeah. So what I have learned as a person working in journalism over the last few years of the news cycle, which includes watching a lot of people fighting on Twitter and comments and stuff like that, but also having watched um, the Walrus Talks, which is the event se- one event series that we do. So these are conversations that, they're events that are held across the country. There's seven speakers usually. Each speaker gets seven minutes and they're not scripted, so they're not programmed before. I happened to come on board just before the year of Canada 150. So there was a theme of we desire a better country. And in every province or territory, there was a different um, walrus talk. And so what I saw would be there might be like a member of the Order of Canada talking about Canada and what it meant. And there might be an Indigenous person saying, Canada is not my country. I don't agree. And over the course of a night actually the course of an hour, you get seven different perspectives on something, which is something that we started doing more of in our own publishing. So a few years ago on the internet, there was a sort of trend. I have a bold opinion. I'm going to put it on the internet. And then 
you know, the next day someone else would be like, let me completely rebut your opinion. And then this would just kind of go back and forth. When it comes to more complicated conversations, I made a list of things that people can't talk about, which is really about 10 things that Canadians especially can't talk about. If you take a complicated conversation and you invite a bunch of different people to talk about it, so it's not two sides, it's like a seven sides or eight sides or nine sides or 10 sides. We did that once with a series on sex ed and we did that once with a series on opioids. And opioids was by far the most successful thing we've done online in terms of numbers. It was looking at a complicated issue, not with a not with a view to who's to blame for it, although, you know, there's solutions are proposed and stuff like that. Why do we have this problem? How do we get here? I've learned that piling on to a conversation is the way to have a good conversation. It's not to say, I've got the solution, let me now propose it to you. Because then that's, um, first of all, egotistical. Mm -hmm. But second, it's more likely in this climate to lead to polarity. Mm -hmm. The thing I like about the Walrus Talks format is that seven people get up on stage and they don't rebut each other. One person talks, then another person talks. There's no Q&A. People are invited to go and talk after in the in the reception. But they don't, like, there's no formal, like, who won, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, perspectives were shared, and then we go. And with the journalism, we're thinking more and more about how to do that. Let's get a few different perspectives on something. And the idea should be to give a person something they hadn't thought about before. So that's a conversation to me. I would agree. I think that f I, for me, a conversation is a place where you can be changed by listening to somebody else. I think I can't remember who said that. Someone actually said that. So I'm not the first. <laughs> no, to me, it's very important to talk to conservatives. It's very important to talk to the far left. It's very important to talk to people that I might not normally come in contact with at all. Um, right now, I'm talking to some people um, about the rise of the Green Party and what that means. You just kind of have to, I do a lot of just like sitting at a dinner next to some person and I'm like, I don't know who you are, but then listen to what's important to them. I think there's a challenge inherent in that too, that, that for example, if I were to have a conversation tomorrow with Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. right, not only am I going to want to um, resist some of the things he says, um, but I'm going to be expected to. There's probably people who listen to this podcast who would expect me to take him to task, quote unquote. That's not a conversation to me. And I think that the best thing I could do in that situation, if I were put in that situation, is to have a conversation and do the same thing that we're doing now, which is let me see things from your perspective for a while. Let me just, you know, what, what they say about wisdom, whereas wisdom is the ability to entertain, entertain a thought without accepting it and to, to take someone else's shoes for a while. It would be really, really hard, though, because I think that I don't know what your list of 10 things are that, that, that are not to be talked about, but I imagine that maybe they're not to be talked about because we can't help but get into a debate with them. We can't help but get into right and wrong and winning and losing. I don't know if that's, that's accurate. but Well, I think, I think you'd have an interesting conversation with Jordan Peterson. I think, why do I think that? He says some crazy things. Yeah. He's making lobster pajamas. <laughs> um, I also think that you'd come away. I don't think you'd win a debate with Jordan Peterson. I don't think that's a thing that can happen. Um, just like I don't think he'd win a debate with you. I think you'd probably both leave thinking exactly what you think. But what you would leave is understanding why Jordan Peterson feels the way he does about what he feels about. And hopefully vice versa. And that would be a conversation. That would be a conversation. Because I think that, you know, Donald Trump, for example, no one is expecting to walk into a room with Donald Trump and change the way he thinks about the world. But but maybe nor should you. I don't know. The, the, the I think we've given up on enlightening Donald Trump. I don't know, like... I mean, who knows? Talking about people that you, like, don't actually know is, is very tricky because mm -hmm. it's like talking mm -hmm. about a celebrity. Yeah, I suspect that he has a short feedback loop. Yeah, and I, I suspect that it's... Who would you rather um, have dinner with, Donald Trump or Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson. I think I would, too. I just think that it doesn't really matter... I don't want to be in the same room as Donald Trump. I just... There's something so amoral about not only the man or the image of the man... But, yeah, and I just read too much. I've, I've read too much. I've thought too much about it. 
and it would be it would feel gross there's too much that he hasn't answered for that's what makes me mad well he'll never answer for it no he 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 will never and i don't think he even knows i think for him it's a game where he just it's a reality show i mean it's just his script for today mm-hmm. it's almost like acting victor newman from uh, Young and the Restless, what did you think in that scene 25 years ago? You know, for him, it was just another, I don't know, I'm, I'm making this One up. One thing that he has, his existence and appearance has forced on us is that we understand ourselves better. There has been yeah. so much writing about what created Donald Trump, what sustains Donald Trump, what might get rid of Donald Trump, how we allow Donald Trump, what we should do about Donald Trump. And like society has just gone through like a massive you know self inquisition <laughs> about what society is so maybe that's one of the things that led us to this weird time where we don't even know if we have the right foundation to have a society i i i agree with that but i've i've realized and read over the past year probably that it's almost like feeding the monster that the only thing donald trump wants is more donald trump oh completely and it doesn't matter if it's a good or bad story it doesn't matter who's covering it and how they cover it i've my um my use of social has really tapered off in the last three or four months. And it's not because I've just realized that it's a self-feeding loop in a way. Like I can get all excited about the quasi news story of the day, or I can focus on what's on the horizon and what hasn't been discovered and what hasn't been reported on. And I'm finding more hope in, in the latter. I'm tired of reacting to buzz. Someone once said that you should never look at anything unless it's going to be important three months from now. Yeah, that's probably good advice. Do you know who said that? Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I saw something where he was asked, what do you, you know, do you look at the news? Do you read the news? And I think his response was something like, I'll only read something if it's going to be important three months from now. Only tenured professors can afford to talk and think like that. Mm. And that's part of what, that's part of what he, I think, offers people is... Yeah, the chance to, I don't know, to take a break. The and chance go with to be old-fashioned. Ter- certainly, yeah. Um, yeah, I've never talked about Jordan Peterson on this program before, so that's interesting. I'm actually surprised. He doesn't come up that much in my life, like other things do. <laughs> Donald Trump comes up a lot in my life. Huge. Yeah, I can imagine. Huge. <laughs> um, Jessica, there's something I wanted to do with you. I've got uh-huh. a list of 10 things, and I just wanted to get your maybe one word or one sentence or one phrase quick reaction to it. So you already know I went to creative writing school, so I am yeah. not responsible for any words that are going to come out of my mouth now. That's, I'm glad you've said that, and that's exactly why I think I'm comfortable doing it, and you would be comfortable doing it, yeah. because this is like uh, stream of consciousness the, stuff. Okay. First time I've done it, so thank you for being my experiment. Okay. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Journalism. Fact. Deplatforming. Twitter. Populism. Steve Bannon. Social media. See, these words are more normal than I was expecting. Um, Social media. iPhone. Globalization. Naomi Klein. Canada. Trudeau. Privacy. So there's a story today, uh, today being July 2019, um, about the Sidewalk Project. The Sidewalk Citizens? Or the... Sidewalk Labs or no? Yeah, the Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto, which is um, an electronic community that's been proposed. And there was another proposal. The the waterfront received other proposals. And so um, one writer in the star today is advocating that we should have looked at some of those other proposals. It's good. It's it's a good read. That's what I think about privacy. Cool. Mm -hmm. Progress. Progress. I thought you were going to tell me like banana and I was going to be like <laughs> kazoo. <you know? laughs> I could. <laughs> These are actually serious words that I've thought too much about. So I'm like, I can give you 10,000 words. I know, words. but don't, but then don't think. Then just what's your first reaction to progress? Bridges. Br- perfect. Yeah. Democracy. Election. Identity. Ah. Identity is the most valuable of all these words right now. Um, Why? Identity has been the foundation of a lot of work we are doing at the Walrus. Not necessarily on port, in, like on purpose. It is a conversation that started to be really important, I would say, around the time of the cultural appropriation debate, which is 2017. And then we really put it on the table, we meaning the collective Canadian writing and editing community, 
I'm starting to hear a bit less about it now, I think because democracy is kind of um, crept up as a bigger and more important word. So if you said identity, I'd say storytelling. Just to add, what would what would democracy be without identity? You know what I mean? Like this concept of identity. That's the problem I have with democracy. I actually think the question, the the topic of conversation you and I have had today is about democracy. I don't think it's about journalism. I think it's about mm -hmm. democracy. I'm not sure that we even understand what democracy is. I think it's a word that I started to hear being tossed around um, like literally 18 months ago as being a thing that we urgently needed to start talking about and solve. And other than that, it would have been something that I took for granted and didn't think about. What does democracy mean to you? Well, again, I think that's... <sighs> One vote per voice? I've, no. Well, I mean, yeah, to some extent, sure. But I think it's... it's. I've overthought this. I've thought about it. I've read too much about it. You know, democ we, do we... I mean, you have to ask the question, do we live in a democracy now? Is this a democracy? Representative democracy where you vote for other people to make decisions for you? It may be effective. It may have the idea of democracy as part of it, but I don't know if that's, you know, pure people power. But is people power going to be Doug Ford, who has a thing on the front of his desk that says for the people as his as his nameplate? Um, well, we don't live in a pure democracy now. No, we live in a theoretical democracy, but it's not democratic for all people. For instance, indigenous people don't necessarily have access to clean water. Right. That's not a democracy. They're not being treated as equal citizens. Uh, we also know that there is foreign interference in our electoral process, likely to be anyway in this upcoming election, and that probably has been in the past. So as long as people don't actually have access to free thought and a fair and just society, we are not living in a democracy. And then you could also say that does a, does a true democracy exist at all? Like Athenian direct democracy from 2,500 years ago. Well, women had no power. Mm -hmm. Slaves had no power. Foreigners had no power at all. Everyone else was treated as a unique individual. But even them were subsumed for, the, like, you know, Socrates was, was forced to take hemlock at the, at the wishes of the quote-unquote state. Is that democracy? Or is that just not liberal democracy? I believe it's always a moving target, but I do think that you can determine and clarify what the benchmark should be and what the goal should be. I think that ties back to what you're saying about Barack Obama. Mm -hmm, Here is something more perfect union. Yeah, I would like to hear more about, and I'd like to know what you think. And I think maybe you should do more podcasts about this. I can sit here as a woman and say that we still make seventy-two cents of what men make on average. If you're a white woman, it's less if you're not. And actually, my numbers are not necessarily right because I think white women do make a bit more. Um, I'm really interested in the inequality between men. That, to me, is such an interesting conversation, and it relates to Jordan Peterson, and it relates to democracy, and it relates to Trump, and it relates to abuse of power, and it relates to Justin Trudeau, and it relates to Jasmine Singh, and it relates to Andrew Scheer. That is, to me, what men have power and what men don't, and how men punish each other for having power and not having power. Yeah, I think that very much is a... It's a conversation that's probably been had before, but we aren't having it now. That's for sure. It's the conversation we need to have. To me, it's way more important. Like when you when we talk about identity, I'm like, well, women are getting a voice. People of color are getting a voice. This is actually partly because of social media. More people have a voice than used to have a voice. And we're publishing these voices in the walrus. So I can do that work. I can support the evolution of society i can give voices to people that didn't have them before but what i can't do is have the conversations that aren't being held yeah you know i mean i think i have a response to, for you that actually ties back to democracy and i think there's a, a fundamental idea to democracy that we don't talk about often enough and i think it relates to the idea that of my being equal or unequal with other men or other people um the idea that i'm equal this idea that I was that I was taught as a young person, this idea that I take for granted in Canadian and Western society that I'm equal, equal in the eyes of the law, equal under the um, auspices of the state, equal with a driver's license, equal in, in many different respects. I am not equal in, the t in terms of how much I get paid. I'm not equal in terms of how much my ideas are listened to or whatever, but legally I'm an equal entity. That's important, to, that's important that, that idea, that belief that I'm equal or that I should be equal. And I think it goes to democracy that one of the most important features of a working democracy is the belief that we're in one. 
is the belief that this is a democracy, or at least it should be. And one of the greatest victories, I think, for democracy and perhaps even equal rights over the last century would be that Vladimir Putin still has to run in elections, right? I mean, a lot of people would say, well, yeah, it's a sham. Yes, it's a sham, but he still does it. Isn't that in and of itself a signal of progress that someone has to go and run in an election even if it's not for real? Because that, that you know, in the same way that we all agree that that there is still racism and sexism in our society, but the fact that it's been pushed underground is a signal in and of itself of a victory of sorts of progress, even if we aren't there yet, and even if we will never get there. But again, a critical feature for me of a democracy is the belief that we're in one, or that we should be in one. I think that's a great line, and I just wrote it down. I think that the frustration is that it's taking a long time for all of us to be equal, and... Mm -hmm. And we're very impatient in this accelerated age. Not just in the accelerated age. Like my mom was a second wave feminist. She told me that I was equal to men, that I could have anything that I wanted and or that I should go out and do whatever I wanted. And I probably felt equal until a certain point. And when I entered the working world, it was very quickly made clear to me that I wasn't equal. Hmm. That, you know, my stories never mind you know it took 10 years before I got my first assignment for the walrus and it was a small one for the back and I'm not I'm glad that the world didn't just hand me opportunities and say here you like I'm glad I had to work for everything that I have because I think whenever I got everything that I did get I was really ready for it but by the same token I think what could I have done over the last 30 years if I wasn't paid 20% less, mm. you know, or having to spend so much of your time and energy on that, on just this fighting, idea. Just, just fighting, fighting to be in the room, just fighting yeah. to be in the room. Yeah. So I think that that's where we're at right now. And it's very hard to explain to people, Oh, you have to wait a little bit longer for equality. You have to wait a little bit longer for democracy. It's like, no, it's, you know, as you and I are talking, it's 2019 and there's no real excuse yeah. We have the means. We have the means. Anyway, I sound pretty revolutionary at this point. No, I, I, I would say well, not only do we have the means, but we seem to have everyone. Uh, we all we all seem to agree. I, I mean, maybe or maybe we don't anymore. I mean, there's no that I, I take back what I said because there are many many people who are very openly loudly disagree who didn't seem to disagree just a few years ago. Inter yes, I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I was talking to some friends about it. How you know, in Toronto, conservatives and liberals used to go to the same dinner parties, mm. you know, and they'd agree to disagree, but they were still in the same conversation. And that, I think, is what's changed. We're working on a project, actually, for the fall about how much Canadians believe in democracy um, that we will publish in September or October. And I think one of the questions is, how many friends do you have that you know, don't have the same political beliefs as you. Yeah. And do you feel safe, you know, in your conversations? Can you say the things you really want to say? I think that would be a very important piece for Canada because mm -hmm. I've seen similar things done in The Economist, uh, in The New Yorker, uh, about polarization mm -hmm. and about this phenomenon that we seem to be experiencing where not only are, are we, do we not have any friends who are the opposite of us on these categories. But if I know one thing about you, I can probably predict a bunch of other things. If I know that you're pro-choice, there are probably a 10 other things that I'm fairly confident mm -hmm. I know about you. This is really important work because it's exposing something that wasn't was totally different not too long ago and that wasn't so personal or so um, emotional. That's what frustrates me about fighting on the internet. Um, like... People get into crazy fights. They don't so much anymore. I think like the appetite for fighting has died down a little bit. But someone will say something and someone else will take it to task. And here I'm talking about like the left, right? Like people who are on the left and are basically aligned, probably voting, voting for the same people. But like you're not, you know, you said something incorrect and now let me correct you. And mm -hmm. the thing that would be really revolutionary would be like if I and all my friends gave up all the money we have and gave it to the poor. 
like didn't live in our houses, didn't shop in farmer's markets, didn't, you know, didn't do all the things that basically, you know, middle class people in Canada do have in common. We have way more in common than we don't. I'd like to see more acknowledgement of that and also more acknowledgement of just people that are really on the outside of that. And, and, and again, going back to the idea of a conversation, we always find common ground in a conversation that's in person. Or yes. A conver- you know, a real conversation. A Twitter battle requires nothing in common. Just maybe, not even the same language. You might as well yeah. just swear at the other person in a different language. But when you're having a conversation like we're having now in person, we must find commonality. We have no choice because we're human beings who seek that out. Yeah. We, you know, it's almost how tribes interact with one another. And, um, yeah. Um, Jessica, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and letting me into your office to give you some editorial advice. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me on and uh, letting us go deep. It's been a pleasure. To learn more about Jessica Johnson, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes as well as a way to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other. Send me your suggestions for future guests as well as future topics that you'd like to be discussed. Your quote of the week is from Theodore Zeldin, and it goes, Conversation is a meeting of minds with different memories and habits. When minds meet... They don't just exchange facts, they transform them, reshape them, draw different implications from them, engage in new trains of thought. Conversation doesn't just reshuffle the cards, it creates new cards. Thanks as always to our composer Andrea Wettstein, and special thanks for this episode to The Walrus Magazine in Toronto for providing us with the space in which to record and have this excellent conversation. Next week, we're talking with Jeffrey Rosenthal, professor at the University of Toronto, about luck and probability. I'll see you then.